Hello, my name is Gay Maxwell, and I'm the Education Coordinator at the Brattleboro Retreat. I'm here at BCTV, where we're, where we're recording our first episode of Keep Talking, a Community Dialogue on Mental Health. Today, we'll be introducing Dr. Joseph Shannon, who has been a, a presenter here at the retreat at the Office of Continuing Education. He's been presenting to a group of 100 mental health clinicians from all over New England. Um, he has come to us uh, from Columbus, Ohio. He presented last week in Delaware. Uh, he'll present next week in Pennsylvania. He travels all over the country talking to mental health clinicians and helping them in their work to uh, work particularly with people who have what is called borderline personality disorder. So um, Joe, we're, thank you so much for coming to the retreat and thank My you pleasure. so much for doing mm -hmm. this television program with My us. I w the thing that I wanted to ask you, um, f first of all, is how did this become a specialty of yours? W what drew you to this particular kind of work? Um, it started when I did my postdoc residency. Um, I went through a pretty traditional uh, psychology graduate program, and uh, my pre-doc residency involved working with students. And uh, it's unusual, to, at least at that time in the early 70s, to encounter a student um, who had something as serious as a personality mm -hmm. disorder. We didn't really talk much about personality disorders back then. Mm -hmm. But then I did a postdoc, and I worked on an admissions unit at a psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, I was encountering a number of primarily women and then later men who met diagnostic criteria for um, some sort of personality disorder. And the one that was the most vexing uh, in terms of treatment was borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And I liked them. I liked working with them. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't frightened of them, even though they could be extremely aggressive, even violent. And people that were supervising me started giving me feedback that I had a real knack for working with severely personality disordered patients, most especially borderline patients. And they, what they told me was is that I had a, a knack for balancing uh, being gracious and respectful on the one hand with being extremely confrontational when I needed to be. Mm -hmm. And that that type of, uh, that combo, if you will, seemed to really work well with uh, personality disorder patients. And so that's how it started. Mm -hmm. um, I liked working with them, they liked working with me, and um, I, was, um, I was drawn to them um, because mm -hmm. they're, at, you know, depending upon what you ask me, we'll see that they're survivors. Well, let me ask you this first. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the phrase personality disorder has been, or tends to be, bandied around by, you know, media, the mm -hmm. people outside perhaps mental health professional circles hear it in the context of the media, they hear it perhaps in scary movies, right. they hear it on TV, uh, um, Oprah, shows like Oprah Winfrey. Celebrities. Uh, celebrities. Celebrities um, out of control. Exactly. Right. And, right. and sometimes uh, we have pictures in our minds of serial killers, um, mm -hmm. uh, war criminals um, that have personality mm -hmm. disorders. But, and, and, we'll, and I'll ask you more about that later, but can you explain personal, what that means exactly? Sure. What is a personality versus a personality that's become disordered? Mm -hmm. Well, your personality um, is comprised of traits and habits. Traits are inherited, habits are learned. And it's about a 60-40 split. 60% 60 of who you are is inherited. It's in place at birth. Your collection of traits is um, actually called your temperament. Mm -hmm. You also have habits. Habits account for about 40% of the personality. Habits are learned ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Your collection of habits is called character. So temperament is inherited, character is learned. If you combine temperament traits with character, habits. That's your personality. Mm -hmm. Your core personality is in place um, no later than adolescence. A lot of developmental psychologists will tell you that it's actually in place by the age of seven or eight. 
when we say that a person is personality disordered, what we're really saying is, is that the traits and the habits that comprise their personality are inflexible and damaging. Mm -hmm. And this creates pain and suffering for the individual who is personality disordered. And it also typically creates pain and suffering for those of us who have to interact with this individual, either in a personal relationship or a professional relationship. Now, the most recent research indicates that about 15 to 20 percent of the world's population is personality disordered. And that's what I was going to yeah. ask you, too. 20%? 20 percent? Wow. One out that's of five. One in five people. One in five people. And what does that mean for, for those of us who have this idea in our heads of of dangerous, um, you know, the, the, the extreme the, characters. The extreme characters. Right. I mean, what's the? What are the other personality disorders? Because there are mm -hmm. there are many, and a lot of people don't know that. The two best known personality disorders, and the two that have been depicted most in major motion pictures, television programs, that sort of thing. The best known personality disorder for men is the narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And this is an individual who is pathologically self-absorbed, uh, a person who is appallingly unempathic, and a person who has a strong sense of entitlement. And the research indicates that that occurs in 6% of the population, um, and that it's mostly men who are diagnosed with it. Um, there are iconic narcissistic characters in literature and in film. The best known that I can think of off the top of my head would be the character of Gordon Gecko in the film oh. Wall Street, played by Michael Douglas. Um, he is an iconic narcissistic character. Um, ironically, I think the best depiction of a narcissistic character ever caught on film is actually of a female narcissist, and you don't see too many of them. It's the character that Meryl Streep plays in the film The Devil Wears Prada, uh -huh. the boss from hell. So I would say the narcissistic is probably the most depicted, and it's typically depicted as a male character. The most depicted of female personality disorders, hands down, is borderline personality disorder. And the person who put that on the map is Glenn Close in her iconic film, Fatal Attraction, where she plays Alex. Um, other iconic female borderlines in film would be Kathy Bates in the film Misery. Mm. Jessica Walter as Evelyn in the film Play Misty for Me. Uh, Louise Fletcher as Nurse Ratchet in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm. Those are iconic, iconic borderline personality disorders. So the types of characters that you don't see on film, for, in, for instance, I mean, can, are, do you have, I mean, because you're such a film buff, and mm -hmm. I know this about you because... Um, you've been to the retreat many times, mm -hmm. and you use film to illustrate many of the, the personality disorders. Are there some that um, you don't even you can't even find some film? Yes. Yes. Or what? they're very rare. Very you, you rare in film. film. One of those would be the schizotypal personality. Mm -hmm. and this is rarely depicted in film. Mm -hmm. One of the few times that it has been depicted in film is the biographical film of Howard Hughes called Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio. He depicts Howard Hughes as a schizotypal personality. That's very unusual. Mm -hmm. A schizotypal individual has many of the characteristics of schizophrenia, but they don't meet um, a full list of diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia. Moreover, they don't respond to antipsychotic medications that are typically very successful with schizophrenic patients. Mm -hmm. We think it's the rarest of all personality disorders, less than 1% of the population. They have a horrible prognosis. The vast majority of them end up abusing substances to self-medicate their symptoms. In fact, we know that they comprise at least 40% of the homeless population, mm. but you rarely see them depicted in film, but that's a personality disorder. Another one would be passive-aggressive personality. Uh, we're all capable of engaging in indirect acts of anger when a person is sneaky or underhanded in the way that they deal with their anger they gossip about you behind your back that sort mm -hmm. of thing but we you, you rarely see a depiction of a full-blown passive aggressive personality in film um, a notable exception to that rule uh, would be the character of george on the long-running uh, series seinfeld uh, all of those four characters were written as personality disordered and george is a textbook uh, passive-aggressive personality, but that's very unusual right. to see that type of character in film. So if I were to hear or someone were to hear 
that their a, a, a family member or loved one had had a diagnosis, had actually had a psychiatric evaluation, mm -hmm. and they were diagnosed with a personality disorder. Mm -hmm. What should they think about that? Would that should that be an alarming thing? Is that uh, are personality disorders treatable? Um, uh, would what what how should they um, organize those mm -hmm. I, those words in their mind or those ideas so that maybe it doesn't feel as um, overwhelming? Overwhelming. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, when a person receives a diagnosis of personality disorder, it can be pretty devastating, mm -hmm. unless you have a really skilled, <clears throat> excuse me, clinician or diagnostician who presents the information to the patient in a way that's kind. Um, that's compassionate and uses a language that the patient is going to understand. Um, a diagnosis of personality disorder is not a death sentence. It's not like being diagnosed with inoperable cancer uh, or Alzheimer's disease or something of that nature. Um, it's a serious diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, you asked um, to what degree is it curable. In the mental health field, um, we're squeamish about that word. Uh, we tend to prefer to what degree is it treatable versus untreatable. Mm -hmm. um, the primary criterion there is this. Some of the personality disorders are clearly more trait-based. They're more inherited. The more inherited a personality disorder is, the less treatable it is, the poorer mm -hmm. the prognosis for recovery. So I mentioned um, the schizotypal personality disorder. We're reasonably certain that that is entirely inherited. In fact, the number one predictor for that personality disorder is having a schizophrenic parent or grandparent. It's a done deal, it's present at birth. Hmm. We might be able to help this person function at a higher level, but they're always going to have that personality disorder because it's largely inherited. And they're going to have certain vulnerabilities because of that, including abusing substances to self-medicate their symptoms. On the other hand, other of the personality disorders are more learned. They're more habit-based. And the nice thing about learned is if it's learned, it can be changed or unlearned if the patient is sufficient, sufficiently motivated. A great example of a personality disorder that we think is almost entirely learned is the dependent personality disorder. This is an individual who is inordinately dependent on others for their sense of self. They have no identity apart from um, whatever uh, goodies they get from a relationship, although the term that's used these days is codependent. We think that dependent individuals become that way in the family of origin. They grow up in a family where independent thinking and behavior is not modeled for them, or worse yet, they grow up in a family where independent thinking and behaving is punished. And so they emerge from that unassertive, passive, um, they defer to others, they, they look to other people for their sense of self. They get taken advantage of by people all the time. High probability that they get involved in abusive um, domestic violence situations. And so the good news is, is that if we can get them in treatment and if we can help them see that there's another way to live, they respond beautifully to the treatment. So there's hope for those individuals. Still other of the personality disorders involve a mixture, a very complex mixture of trait and habit. And they require a more complicated type of treatment protocol uh, with an uncertain prognosis for recovery. The best example of that would be borderline personality disorder, which is arguably the most famous of all personality disorders. Mm -hmm. um, they can be treated and they can become higher functioning, but they will always have their disorder they will always have certain vulnerabilities, certain uh, sensitivities, most especially to interpersonal rejection um, that we can't really eradicate. And they'll probably need to be in some sort of treatment, at least periodically, for the rest of their life. What brings someone who has a personality <laughs> disorder to treatment usually? What are the problems they may face as a result of having a personality mm -hmm. disorder? Well, I, I, I joke with my class that in 38 years of clinical practice, because I've been doing this since 1974, mm -hmm. I have never once in 38 years had a patient come into my office and say, Hi, Dr. Shannon, I am a profoundly personality disordered individual. <laughs> uh, this means that I have a pervasively pathological way of viewing myself, viewing the world, and interacting with the world to get my needs met. 
I'm here for immediate and intensive reconstructive psychotherapy. <laughs> that has never happened to me in 38 years of practice. <laughs> Personality disordered people, if they do come into treatment, a lot of them don't because they're in denial, but if they do come into treatment, they present the same kinds of issues that non-personality disorder patients would present. They present with depression. They present maybe with symptoms of bipolar disorder, what we used to call manic depressive disorder. They present with a severe anxiety disorder like social phobia. They present with um, a substance abuse problem. They present with relationship issues. A very common complaint that I hear with personality disorder patients is, I've not been able to achieve my potential hmm. even though I held great promise as a youth. I was a four-point student, I was a four-point student in college, and yet I am still in um, a very low-level kind of job. I get passed over for promotions all the time. I don't understand this. And as we start to work with these people, those like myself, we typically find that these presenting issues that they bring into treatment are the proverbial tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. They're symptoms of a much larger problem that have to do with their personality, how they see themselves, how they see the world, and how they interact with the world to get their needs met. Mm -hmm. So the person who, gets, who keeps getting passed over for promotions, it typically has nothing to do with their intelligence or their skill. It's because they have an abrasive personality. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the converse, they're too passive. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to advocate for themselves. Um, they're very much of a doormat. That would be kind of the dependent personality. So is some of the work that you do with people really about helping them relationally, making connections yes. to the world in a, in a way that they haven't been able to do before? Exactly. A lot of personality disordered people have profound difficulty with relationships. Mm -hmm. And that oftentimes, more than anything else, is what will bring them into treatment. Um, they reach a point where they've hit bottom. You know, they've had several failed relationships. They've not been able to forge friendships. They've lost several jobs, <clears throat> or at least haven't been promoted. And for years and years and years, they keep saying it's the other person's fault. They project blame. Personality disordered individuals are masters of projecting blame onto people and circumstances outside of themselves for the problems that they create. But most of them, at some point, hit a bottom mm -hmm. where they can no longer look anywhere but the mirror. And then they realize, my God, I've done this to myself. And that's oftentimes when they'll come into treatment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're court-ordered into treatment. Um, a lot of personality disordered individuals that are court-ordered into treatment have an issue with domestic violence. Mm -hmm. In fact, we see the highest incidence of domestic violence um, among people who are personality disordered as the perpetrators and as the victims mm -hmm. of domestic violence. Um, they oftentimes have, um, they're court-ordered into treatment because they've been convicted of DUI or DWI. And they go before a compassionate judge who says, you can either go to treatment or I can send you to jail. And so the patient opts to go into chemical dependency treatment. And then during the course of chemical dependency treatment, the therapist working with them says, you know, I think it might be a good idea for you to work with a psychologist or a social worker to address some defects of character. Mm -hmm. Because this is fueling your substance abuse. And oh, by the way, you had these defects of character long before you took your first drink or did your first drug. And so then they come into treatment for that reason. I've often heard um, uh, people say that um, in a family system that, that you can tell that um, the person, well, certain personality disordered person in the group because everybody else is on medication. That's right. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, how family members would know that they were perhaps in relationships with somebody that's personality disordered. I, I think probably it would be easy to take on a lot of uh, that one's self-esteem might get damaged in those mm -hmm. kinds of relationships. How do you know when, when you're in something like that that might be um, that actually your loved one or your family member, they might need help, and, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but how do you know? Mm -hmm. There are six signs. Six, six signs. Here they are, very quickly. One you're dealing with a person who's unbelievably rigid. Um, they may have some insight into the idea that they make mistakes or that they don't adapt to situations very well, mm -hmm. but they're never able to translate that insight into specific attitudinal and behavioral change. Mm -hmm. So they're incredibly rigid individuals. Number two, 
they have a tendency to make the same mistakes repeatedly. Mm. And the mistakes are oftentimes of a circular nature. Number one example, the person who hooks up with one train wreck of a relationship after another, after another, mm. after another. And when they're in that relationship, they'll complain to anyone who will listen to them that they're miserable with this person. And they also state that if they ever get out of this relationship, they'll never let this happen again. And we all know how this plays out. They somehow manage to get out of that relationship. And within six months to a year, they're either back with the original train wreck or they've hooked up with a more intriguing train wreck. Someone who's better looking, better sexually, makes more money, drives a better car, but it's still a train wreck. So these mistakes that they keep making over and over again. My, 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 my favorite example though of this is the person who is repeatedly, repeatedly abusing credit or otherwise making bad financial decisions. They just don't learn from those mistakes. I have a guy that I'm working with right now whose wife is just frantic because they're filing bankruptcy for the third time. Mm -hmm. In 21 years, every seven years like clockwork, this guy overcharges his credit cards and puts the entire family into financial jeopardy. Mm -hmm. He makes 40000 a year as a state employee and currently has 37 credit cards and over $250,000 in credit card debt. Not a problem. Let's just file for bankruptcy. That's a personality disorder person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Third characteristic, they're unstable. They may have periods of stability, but for the most part, they're emotionally unstable. Fourth characteristic, they're clueless. Number one, they don't get how sick they are. And very importantly, they don't get how their sickness is affecting other members of the family. Or they do get it and they just don't care. Number five, when they're confronted with a problem, they don't engage in problem solving. They create a drama and they cast themselves in one of three roles. They either see themselves as a victim, they see themselves as a hero, or they see themselves as a villain or a maverick or a rebel. And depending upon what role they cast themselves in, that determines what role they cast their husband, their wife, or their partner in. So if I see myself as a victim and you're my wife, very likely that I'm going to either see you as my hero, you need to rescue me from all of my misery, or if you don't meet my expectations, you're a villain. Mm -hmm. You're the reason that I'm so unhappy. That's how they view life. It's as if it were a drama of some sort. Mm -hmm. Sixth characteristic, everybody in the family is on psychotropic medication <laughs> except for the personality disordered person. And the only reason that they're on psychotropic medication is that they need it to survive the fact that the family is being held hostage by this individual. Mm -hmm. So there is that sense of being held hostage that Yes. It's one of those signs. It, you feel like you're, you're, it is no different than being in an alcoholic family. Mm -hmm. The identified alcoholic holds the alcoholic family hostage, mm -hmm. and oftentimes the spouse is the chief enabler. That's the way it is with families where there's a personality disordered parent, and in some cases it's the child that's personality disordered, and it's usually one of the parents who's the chief enabler. Male narcissists typically grow up in families where they're enabled and overindulged by their mothers mm -hmm. and their fathers are either absent or inordinately punitive. Mm -hmm. Female narcissists are usually daddy's girls. They're overindulged by their fathers, never held accountable for their behavior, and they alienate their mothers. Mm -hmm. Very common dynamic mm -hmm. uh, in those families. Speaking, you were speaking of villains a few uh, uh, moments ago, and it made me uh, want to ask some of these questions I had because I think the word, one thing we haven't talked about a whole lot is the antisocial personality disorder. The most toxic of the toxic. Yeah. And that word gets, again, bandied about in yes. the media and television shows and we have these images of, of you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler, um, Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Right. We had these... Amadina uh, the, Job. 
Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Also known as I'm a dining chair. That's right. That's what the Goldberg <laughs> calls him. Yes, right. And, um, but what I've read also is that, uh, well, first of all, answer this question for me. The difference between antisocial personality disorder, psychopath, and sociopath. Those, a, are, those are three terms that get bandied about willy-nilly. Will, yeah, willy they're misused all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, The term sociopath and the term antisocial personality disorder can be used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're an old timer like me, you use the term sociopath. If you're a hip hop and happening youthful therapist, you use the term antisocial. Because when you use the term sociopath with sociopaths, it hurts their feelings. They prefer the term antisocial. That's Mm -hmm. really the truth, by the way. That's Mm -hmm. why we use the term antisocial. Um, Let me talk about them first. The antisocial, also known as sociopathic personality. 4% of the general population across cultures, and they're responsible for 80% of the crime that is perpetrated in any culture. That's one in 25 Mm -hmm. you're talking about. Mm -hmm. 4% of the population responsible for 80% of the crimes perpetrated in any culture. So high degree of probability this individual is going to be engaging in illegal, perhaps even criminal behavior. Number two, major gender differences. And these have been validated by research. This is not a statistical artifact. For every one female diagnosed with this disorder, the antisocial or sociopathic personality, there are four men diagnosed with the disorder. Mm. And that's thought to be a true statistic. And to this day, we don't know why that is the case. Although we suspect it has to do with the fact that to the extent that men produce more testosterone than women, and that testosterone is associated with aggressive um, behavior and that we see a lot of aggression in the antisocial personality. It would make sense that we would see a higher incidence of this in the male population than the female population, Mm -hmm. but that's just conjecture. We really don't know why. Mm -hmm. Um, The biggest myth about the antisocial or sociopathic personality is that you're only going to see it in career criminals, typically who come from a background of poverty, who dropped out of high school or middle school, who have a history of engaging in criminal behavior early in life, and who also likely have a history of abusing substances early in life. And you're saying this is the myth. That's the myth. That's the myth. That's the myth. In reality, the sociopath is in every sector of society. Well, it would have to be if it's one in 25 people. Well, no, it's not one in 25, 4% of the population. 4% of the population, so I'm thinking, oh, okay. Yeah. If it were one one in 25, it would be really scary around here. It would be very scary here in Brattleboro. No, it's, it's, uh, well, to to put that into perspective, that would be about 14 million people Mm -hmm. in this country. We have 300, a little over 300 million people living here. About 14 million of those people will meet diagnostic criteria for a full-blown antisocial or sociopathic personality. That's still a lot of people. Are you, people. Are, are, are we encountering people, let's say, at work, at church? I mean, we, we sort of think Jeffrey Dahmer. We're not mm-hmm. thinking well, our he's boss. Not, Jeffrey Dahmer, Saddam Hussein, Adolf Hitler, none of them are sociopathic personalities. Ah. They're psychopathic. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Good. Okay? A sociopath is a person who's a pathological liar. That means that they lie repeatedly even when it would be easier for them to tell the truth. It means that they get a kick out of lying. They get an adrenaline rush out of it. And even most disturbingly, they come to believe their own lies. So that's why a lie detector test is useless with a sociopath. They'll pass it, even though they're lying, because they come to believe their own lies. So pathological lying. Pervasively dishonest, pervasively uh, manipulative. The psychopath is a sociopath who also has a delusional belief system. Mm. Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, Saddam Hussein, all of those people had delusional belief systems. So it's a sociopath with a twist. I see. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us and taking the time today and for also your incredible um, presentations that you you give to us at the retreat. And thanks so much uh, um, to everyone for joining us today.